Car, the copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Pulling all cars, attention all cars, attention all Fresno County Sheriff's cars. On the lookout for fallen described men. Number one, 35 years of age, sallow complexion, wearing a cap, a brown suit. Number two, around 25, slender bill, thin face, wearing a light cap, blue coveralls. These men held up and robbed the first state bank of Clovis at $30,000 an hour ago. Gathering the facts for these true crime broadcasts, executives of the Rio Grande Oil Company personally contact the police officers involved, so many of whom are using Rio Grande cracked gasoline in their daily work. In Oakland, in Berkeley, in Los Angeles, and in many other cities and counties of California and Arizona, these investigators have found why Rio Grande cracked gasoline is specified exclusively for all emergency cars. These cities and counties have made repeated tests of the many gasolines available and have yet failed to find any gasoline which can outperform Rio Grande crack. In all features, quick starting, acceleration, speed, power, it has no superior. And yet with all these advantages, it costs no more to buy and actually costs less per mile. Official records prove these claims. And that's why more police and emergency cars use Rio Grande crack wherever it is sold than any other gasoline. Try it in your car. Get a sample of police car performance, and you too will acknowledge that Rio Grande crack gasoline gives you the most for your money. It is our great pleasure to present Sheriff George Overholt of Fresno County. Sheriff Overholt. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. There is an interesting parallel to be drawn between the psychology of the lawbreaker and the psychology of his eternal enemy, the police officer. It could be summed up in one word, patience. The average criminal does not possess this golden virtue, virtue because he is motivated primarily, primarily by one by three. When we are pitting our forces against the lawbreaker who has patience, then we have a really difficult time. But in, the ca in this case, in the case you're about to hear, a typical case from our files it was the patience of the police officer which destined from the beginning that the criminal should be caught. For the police officer dedicated to but one aim, the eradication of crime has his entire life, if necessary, to accomplish the solution of a single case. The criminal must commit further crime to satisfy his insatiable greed. Lacking the patience and foresight for the, of the forces of society, he sooner or later walks into a trap such as the patience, patience of my colleague O.J. King wove in this evening's case. February 5th, 1924. Two men enter the first state bank of Clovis, California. Mr. Howenson, the only employee in the bank, turns to his window. Yes, sir? There's this 20 for you. Yes, sir. How would you like it? Uh, ten and a five is in Clovis. Right away. All right, go on in, Bert. See that door by the window. Okay. Here we are. Ten. Take up your hand. What? Oh. Mr. Hold up, sir. Tie his hands behind his back, Bert. I get him covered. Right. Now, look here. I... If you know it's good for you, shut up. We ain't aching to do any killing. But the will if it's necessary. No, he won't slip out of that knot. Good. Now, get back there in the boat, you. Go on. You're not going to lock me up in there, are you? Get back there, I said. All the way at the back. Okay, Bert. Empty those chairs for us. Right. Want these traveler checks and bonds? I want everything we can carry. Okay. There, that's got it all. Okay, let's go. 
We're going to lock you in, pal, so you won't get any harm. Well, please don't do that. Ah, they'll find you sooner or later. Hey, Tom, here comes somebody crossing the street. He looks like he's coming here. Get him over the door. When he opens it, stick your gut in his head. Okay. Hear him up, mister. Yeah, what's going on here? What's it look like, a tea party? Look here, I'm the vice president of this thing. Well, that's just dandy. Now, get over there by that filing cabinet and face the wall. Well, look here, my man. Do you really... Get over it quick. Now, if you're smart, you'll stay right there for five minutes. Come on, Bill. Oh, and you'd uh, better unlock that vault sometime this afternoon. Your pal's in there. The excited descriptions that Howenson and Rayburn give Sheriff William F. Jones of Fresno County and Deputy Sheriff O.J. King are incomplete and confused. All they discover in Clovis that they can help them is capturing the robbers, is that they have escaped from the black touring car. Then the following day, the owner of a garage in Fresno informs the sheriff that there's a suspicious car at his place. Sheriff Jones, accompanied by Deputy Sheriff King, visits the garage to listen to the attendant's story. I was nosing around this car, and I found a half-full sack of roof and nails in the back and a bullet. And I remembered reading about that bank holdup yesterday and how the guys had pulled it through roof and nails up behind them. And I thought maybe this was the car. Which one is it? That black Chandler over there, Sheriff. Let's look at it, King. You haven't touched anything in the car, have you? Oh, no, sir. I left everything just the way I found it. Good. Take down that license number, King. Yeah, sir. Three, six, five, three, four, five. Did you know the sheriff that those plates are wired on or sort of bolted? Yes, so they are. Probably stolen. Here are the roofing nails in the shell. And the gas can is missing from those canteens on the running board. Yes, and it looks as though the car was recently painted black. Hmm. Pretty bad job. You can tell it was originally blue. Say, who left this car here? Well, a fellow drove it in yesterday about 1.30 in the afternoon. An hour before the bank robbery. And he said he wanted to store it for a couple of days. What was his name? He signed T.T. Jones on the register. Ever seen him before? No, sir. What did he look like? Well, he was kind of tall and slender, and he was dark complexion. Hmm. Think you'd know him again if you saw him? Oh, sure. But a roundup of suspicious, tall, slender, dark men proves fruitless. The license plates are checked through Sacramento and proven to be stolen, and the motor number of the car shows it also to have been taken without the permission of its owner. Thus, the identity of the Clovis bandits remains a mystery for two weeks, and then a prying citizen, not content to mind his own business, carries a suspicious tale to the sheriff. It's been more than a week now since I seen anybody in that house next door to me, Sheriff. I noticed that the back door was wide open, but the house looked deserted. So I finally decided to investigate. I only went over there this morning. What'd you find? Well, uh, those people who live there must have left in a hurry. Because there's dishes still in the kitchen sink and water in the bathtub. Even a meal on the table still. As though they left in the middle of dinner. Well, I guess we'd better go over there and have a look. To the mystery house on Roosevelt Avenue goes Sheriff Jones, accompanied by Deputy Sheriff King and several city policemen. While King investigates the garage in back, Sheriff Jones and the officers go over the house. Here's some receipts in his desk drawer, Sheriff. Hmm, let me see them. Well, rent receipt dated January 29th. Made out to Mrs. Joseph J. Ray. And gas and light receipts for the same person. Hey, Sheriff, I forgot some things. What? I found the dresser drawer in the bedroom. Clean laundry. Any marks on it? Uh, just a minute, I'll see. Yeah, there's a mark on this shirt. 6P788. And the same marks on these handkerchiefs. And here's a couple of towels with the word Casa Moreno embroidered on them. Well, there's nothing in the law that says tenants can't move out of a house and leave some, some handkerchiefs and towels behind them. Say, uh, maybe they were ducking the rent. No, according to this receipt, the rent isn't due for another week or ten days. Well, it looks funny to me. I don't see anything for us to do but notify the landlady that her house is empty. Just leave that stuff in the drawer, Ben. Maybe they'll come back for it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I yes. think you along with something. Yeah, what? Now, listen, you remember that, uh, that the car you went over, the uh, black channel that uh, had been used in the Clovis Bank job? Yes. Now, uh, that car was painted black in the garage out back. What? Yes, sir. There's a couple of half-empty cans of black paint out there. And also the curtains that were missing from that chandler. 
And oh, yeah, the gasoline can that was missing from that uh, set on the running board. Well, that's different. Get that laundry out of the drawer, Ben, and collect those receipts. It's only a matter of tracing the marks on this laundry king, and we'll have the identity of the bank robbers. But the matter does not prove as simple as the sheriff had sanguinely anticipated. For weeks, the police in San Francisco, Oakland, Los Angeles, Portland, and Seattle assist the Fresno authorities in searching for the laundry mark 6P788. Sheriff Jones assigns Deputy Sheriff King to full time on this colossal task. The services of Phil Giac, a detective specializing in bank jobs, is also enlisted. Together, King and Giac interview laundry after laundry. Finally, weeks after the holdup, they enter the Snow White Laundry, a small establishment in Oakland. Yes, sir. Did you have some laundry here? No, we're from the Fresno County Sheriff's Office. Oh, yeah? We're uh, tracing a laundry mark. Do you use a mark like the one on this handkerchief? T-7-A-X. Uh, don't look familiar. Well, you've got a book or something that lists them, don't you? Yeah. I'll look in it if you want me to. <laughs> but it ain't too much trouble. Huh? Just a minute. Take your breath and keep your fingers crossed, Phil. Yeah, my fingers are all callous from keeping them crossed. It don't look like there's a laundry using that mark this side of Bangor, Maine. Hey, what did you say that number was again? T788. Oh, well, I doubt if it's ours. We never seem to have the numbers you officers want. <laughs> Guess we cater to a higher type of customer. Don't you suppose that's why? Possibly. Would you mind going back? You turned two pages that time. Oh, did I? Yeah. <laughs> That's funny, and I turned right by the piece. <laughs> now, let me see. Well, what do you know? Oh, did you find it? Yeah, here it is. P788. What's the name of the customer that used that mark? Says Ryan here. What initials? Doesn't give any. Address? The Watson Apartments, 724 15th Street. Come on, King, that's all we need. Are you the proprietor here? I'm uh, Mrs. Watson, the owner. Well, we're officers from Fresno County. We want some information about some tenant of yours named Ryan. Why, they haven't been here since last September. What were their full names? Mr. and Mrs. T.J. Ryan. What did they look like? Well, Mr. Ryan was about 40 years old, sort of short and stout, and his head was bald in the front. Uh, Mrs. Ryan was about, oh, about 30. She was sort of pretty and wore stylish clothes. They have a lease? Yes. Who would find it? Mr. Ryan. Have you got that lease here? Well, yes, I believe so. Well, may we see it? Well, yes, if, if I can find it. It should be in this drawer in the desk. Oh, yes, here it is. Hey, look at that, Phil. Yeah. If I remember right, this is darn close to the handwriting of T.T. Jones on the register of that garage in Fresno. I'd like to borrow this for a handwriting comparison, Mrs. Watson. Very well. Now, do you know where these Ryans went after they left here? Why, yes. They said they were moving to the Casa Moreno. Where's that? Over on Market Street. That all ties in, Phil. We found some napkins from the uh, Casa Moreno in that house they abandoned in Fresno. Yeah, we'd better go over there right away, then. <laughs> Why, yes, Mr. and Mrs. Ryan took an apartment here on September 24th. They were with me until the day before Christmas last year. Well, where'd they move to? Well, they didn't say, but they had their baggage taken away by the Federal Transfer Company. Yeah, I moved them plus to Mrs. Ryan. Where? Now, let me see. What was the uh, Hickok Apartments on Vallejo Street in San Francisco? Yes, I'm uh, Mrs. Hickok. Why, yes, the people you described registered here at Christmas time, but about two weeks later they skipped out, owing me the most. So tediously from apartment house to apartment house, the officers follow their quarry, always just a jump behind them. Then, while seeking an apartment house on Eureka Street, they see a woman answering Mrs. Ryan's description leave the place. They follow her for days, hoping she will lead them to Ryan. But finally, while chasing a Vallejo bound stage on which she is riding, they have a flat tire and are forced to abandon the chase. But their fallen hopes are revived next day by the information that T. Ryan had purchased an automobile in Oakland. They run down this clue and next day report to the sheriff in Fresno. 
Well, boys, did you get anywhere? Did we? I'll say so. Where's your prisoner? Oh, we haven't got him yet. Do we know who he is? Fine. Who is he? Name's Thomas Griffin. Served two hitches in San Quentin, ran larceny and burglary. Well, how'd you find that out? Well, as usual, criminals, he slipped. When he bought the used car from this dealer in Oakland, he and this dealer of his looked it over together. The dealer made a crack about just the things for your wife. Our man said that she wasn't his wife. She was a nurse at the hospital in Vallejo, and that his name was Griffin. Well, how do you tie it up? That's why. Right. There's a gang of bank robbers from the east hanging out in Vallejo, according to the boys up north. Now, we lost our dame when she was on the Vallejo stage. We haven't been able to tie the name Regan or Ryan on a record we've got on file. We tried Griffin, and here it is. Look at that card. He fits every description we have on him. Good work, boys, good work. One time a hunch played outright. But say, have you any idea where you'll find Thomas Griffin? No, but we're going back over the trail again. We're bound to catch up with him. Back over the tedious trail go the officers checking the computing addresses, checking known acquaintances and friends of the wanted couple. Such is fruitless. Their discouragement great when a tip from Sheriff Jones that a Mr. and Mrs. T.J. Ryan own a small ranch in Solano and sends them scurrying to Vacaville. They drive to the neighborhood of the Ryan Ranch outside the town and pulling up beside the road, they plan their strategy. If the same is as smart as she ought to be, she'll take us for both. All yeah, right. And if Griffin is there, we're liable to end up on a plank if we start nosing around. Of course, this lead might be a blind. After all, Ryan isn't an uncommon name. He comes to cut up the road. That's asking some phony question. Hey, uh, kid. Yeah? You uh, live around here? Sure. Just up the road a piece. Uh, we're looking for Mrs. Jameson. You know where she lives? No, sir. I never heard of her. I'm supposed to be around here someplace. I don't know no Mrs. Jameson. Well, she lives in that house over there? Oh, no. Mrs. Ryan lives there. Mrs. Ryan, eh? Does she live alone? Uh-huh. She's got a husband, but he went away a couple of days ago. Can you imagine that? Missing again. But you don't know any Mrs. Jameson, huh? No, sir. <laughs> Guess he works directed right, then. Thanks, kid. You're welcome. Let's go, partner. Now, wait a minute. We're not sure whether these are the Ryans we're looking for. And here's our chance. What do you mean? That dame just came out of that house. Hand me those binoculars from the back, will you? Here you are. Thanks. Uh, darn these things. I never could get them focused right. There. There we are. Still, it's her. It's our Mrs. Ryan or Regan or Griffin or whatever her name is. Let's get out of here fast. We don't want her to spot us. For ten days, the two officers watched the Ryan ranch from the cover of a haystack, noting every movement of Mrs. Ryan through their high-powered binoculars. But no one visits the woman. Griffin never returns, and finally Mrs. Ryan packs up and leaves the ranch. The officers are close behind her when she drives back to Oakland. They watch her as she registers in a cheap hotel, and 15 minutes later, they have taken rooms across the street, commanding a view of into hers. The next day, when she enters the downtown bank, they are close behind her. And when she leaves, they approach the bank official with whom she's been talking. We're uh, police officers. Yes, gentlemen. I wonder that woman what she was just talking to. Well, she has a safe deposit box here. What for? We never require that information of our customers. Oh, did she use the box? Uh, yes. Where's she putting it? Well, I don't know. We provide private boots for the depositors. You'd better open that box for us. Well, I, I can't do that. We're investigating a bad beat, a bank robber. How do you know this woman isn't looking this place over for the next job or gang pool? Uh, still, I, I can't let you into the box. The law forbids it. And anyway, we have no keys excepting those in the possession of the depositor. Now, look here, young fellow. This is important, and you're obstructing... Wait a minute, King. He's right. He has no way to let us into the box, even if you were permitted to by law. We'll have to watch it. Watch it? What for? I just thought of something. This Harris gang is supposed to be hiding out up in Vallejo. He used the gag back east. What gag? Sending messages through a safe deposit box. Safer than the mail, see? I get it. It's worth a try. <laughs> Deputy Sheriff King takes up his vigil, hidden in the vault of the bank, watching day after day for the return of Mrs. Ryan. Finally, three days later, he sees her enter the vault to remove a paper from the safe deposit box and replace it with another. 
After tearing up the first paper and throwing it in the waste basket, she goes out. Carefully, King retrieves the abandoned scraps of paper, rushes with them to his partner. Behind locked doors of the hotel room, they carefully piece the sheet together. Yes. It goes in here. And the square piece fits in after the F on the third line. Right. There we are. It says, Dear Dad, if you come in, you will find me at the Hotel Wilson. Ask for Mrs. T.J. Ryan. You are right, Phil. She's using the safe deposit box for a mailbox. She's coming to the other key to the box, and she's expecting him to come back. Yep. And it's only a matter of time until he walks into our hands. If you can hang out that long. Don't worry about me. I'll sit down in that vault for the next year if I have to. While King stakes out 16 hours a day in the vault, and Giac, his partner, keeps tab on the outside activities of Mrs. Ryan, Sheriff Jones enlists the aid of his wife and the wife of under Sheriff George Oberholt, who, using assumed names, moves into the hotel in the next room to Mrs. Ryan, seek to make her acquaintance, gain her confidence. May 28, 1924. Officers piece together the second note removed from the safe deposit vault. It reads... Go to your aunt's house and stay there until I see you. Very important. May 29th. In the morning, the following note is removed and torn to bits. Dear Daddy, I closed up the ranch and am here at the Hotel Wilson, 17th and Grove Street. And in the afternoon, the officers discover... Dear Daddy, have closed up the ranch. A man was there looking for you. Go to your aunt's house and get in touch with me. Very important. June 10th, 1924. Dear Daddy, phone me at the Hotel Wilson, room 411, under the name of Mrs. T.J. Ryan. May get another room, but will stay in the same hotel. Very important. Have sale for property, but can't sell unless you sign it in my name. Hurry and come to me. I need you. Day after day, week after week, the distraught Mrs. Ryan leaves her plaintive messages in the safe deposit box for her absent husband never knowing that she is constantly under the surveillance of the law, that those two nice ladies next door are wives of the law, that across the street the law sits with field glasses watching her when she's at home, that she's accompanied by the law when she goes out on the street, that within six feet of her as she enters the bank vault sits the law, that she is unwittingly serving as a decoy for her husband. Hiding in the bank vault, day after weary day, sits Deputy Sheriff King. May becomes June. June melts scorching into July, and July gives away to August. It seems futile, hopeless, yet King will not give up. And on the 74th day of his vigil, a short man with baldish head appears at the vault. Signing the name T.J. Ryan in the register, he goes to box 1407. King, recognizing him, takes a fleeting glance at the register and steps up behind him. Up your hands, Griffin. What? Hi. Just make sure you haven't got a gat hidden somewhere. Hey, what's this all about? You're under arrest. For what? Hold up and robbery of the Clovis Bank last February. Stick out your arm. Hey, it's a bum piece, copper. I don't know anything about it. Tell that to the judge. Did they get Tom? Did they get him? Yes, ma'am, they did. Oh, Tom. Oh, but poor Daddy. Come along, ma'am. Griffin, stoutly proclaiming his innocence, is brought back to Fresno to face trial. The woman who had passed as his wife is released for lack of sufficient evidence to prosecute. Griffin is sentenced to Folsom Penitentiary for from five years to life. year and a half later, in the stone quarry at Folsom. How about you boys? You all set? Sure. Now don't forget, Mike, when you get the truck wheeled outside the wall, ask that bull to go in with you. Don't give him an excuse you like, but get him back inside. Sure, I know. Hey, watch out. That gun bull's looking our way. Well, don't act dumb. Start loading the truck some more. There. He's 
gone. Okay. Come on, Eddie. You and Red slide into the truck. Yeah. A nice job you did on this platform, Mike. Sure, I fixed it good. You know, I'm getting out in a few more years. You guys have got life here. What the devil? You, you need a break. Okay, Mike. We're all tucked away underneath. Start rolling the truck. All right. Here we go. Hey, guys. Dump truck going out. Okay, come along. Hurry it up. All right. Dump it here, Mike. Oh. oh. What the devil's the matter with you? Oh, I got a pain. Say, maybe you better take me back to see the doctor. Oh! What are you doing, Stalin? No, on the level, I got a real bad pain. You know, I catch up like that often. We better see the doctor. Well, okay, come on. Oh, I tell you, I Okay, boys, they're back inside the wall. Come on. Hear that, Mike? A swell actor. Well, sir. All right, boys, can the chatter? Come on, down the bank with you. They'll miss us in a minute. Thomas Griffin, the owl, the three-time loser, dead by the side of the road the next morning. I leave it to the judgment of the listener whether the quick reward from a bank robbery was worth the life he led, the price he paid, and the death he died. Griffin's uh, partner in the Clovis Bank holdup, Felix Sloper, was caught some time later when he tried to shoot his way out of a San Francisco bank robbery. Sloper sent a bullet through a police officer on that job, but in the end, society sent him crashing through the gallows at San, at San Quentin. Thank you, Sheriff Overholt. How can any red-blooded boy or girl listen to this program and not feel the urge to join the police in their war on crime? Rio Grande has organized a junior police department, which now has hundreds of thousands of members. So boys and girls can learn detective work and police methods. Every member of this junior police department is entitled to a free detective microscope, fingerprint outfit, mystery writing and code outfit, as well as guns, handcuffs, badges, and many other articles, all free. Your neighborhood dealer who sells Rio Grande cracked gasoline will help you get this complete junior police outfit in a hurry. Ask him. Millions of motorists all over America are now taking their cars to the nearest dealer selling Sinclair motor oils to Sinclairize for summer. The time has come to change oil and lubricants throughout your car. 
And every Rio Grande class gasoline dealer is now a trained specialist in Sinclair scientific lubrication. Because Sinclair is one of the world's largest manufacturers of lubricants, all Rio Grande dealers are equipped with authoritative, up-to-the-minute information on exactly how and what oils and lubricants to apply to every car made according to its mileage. You can Sinclairize for summer wherever Rio Grande cracked gasoline is sold. Attention all cars. Fresno Sheriff's Office calling all cars. A cancellation broadcast 129 regarding a bank holdup in Clovis. Suspects in this case now in custody. And that's all. Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company.